All right, everybody, welcome. Thank you guys for coming to uh, this breakout. How many of you guys enjoyed our first session already? Um, well, I'm not going to be up here talking a whole lot, but for, uh, my name is Zach. I'm the student pastor um, at our Richland campus, and uh, it's my privilege today to get to host uh, Pastor Toby Cavanaugh. Pastor Toby, um, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself, but he is the pastor of our Radiant School of Ministry, and um, is just an amazing man of God, amazing pastor, so we are um, excited just to get to learn from him and his wisdom today. So if you guys can give it up for Pastor Toby Cavanaugh. Thanks, Zach. So uh, this last week, our family was on a family trip. We were going to a memorial service for my wife's grandma who had passed away a few months ago. And uh, we were going to start driving in the evening to Rhode Island from here. And so we had to stop somewhere at night. And I don't know if it's because I was a missionary for a lot of years or because I'm really good with money, or I'm because I'm a really bad dad. But when we stop at a hotel like that, I have four kids, we're getting one room and we're all sleeping in one room together. <laughs> and so up to this point, my kids are like 10, 9, 7, and 4. It's worked out good because you can talk the little ones into sleeping on the floor like it's some kind of an adventure for them. It's like, oh, and we got this nook over here for you, you know? And, uh, and then you, you share a bed, right? And, and do the thing. But this time, my kids had fallen asleep in the car before we got to the hotel, and so when we had to wake them up to go into the hotel, they were not having any of that at all. And so they're screaming, they're crying, it's horrible, it's a disaster, and finally my wife just says, it, it, it's okay, I'm going to sleep on the floor. And in that moment, as the husband, you know you can't let that happen. And so I'm like, couldn't we have the little one sleep on the floor? Like, he doesn't have seniority, you know? Like, but I, she was like, no, I was like, no, I'll, I'll do it. I'm like, no, honey, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll take one for the team. And so I'm laying on the floor between the two queen beds. We got like a hotel sheet beneath me, you know, to save me from any diseases that are there. <laughs> and I thought that would be okay, because I used to do this when I was younger, and I just could not sleep for forever. And you, know, you kind of think, you know, I'm a big boy, that like it, it gives you a little more padding you know, as you're laying down on the floor, but that's not actually how it works. It's just more weight driving your bones down into the hard floor. And so I'm like just nap tossing and turning. And as the hours go by, that spirit of sacrificial agape love for my wife begins to fester into resentment, right? And you're just laying on the floor of like, I'm the biggest person, and I should not be on the floor. I can't believe my kids are up in the bed right now. This is horrible. Nobody loves dad. I don't get any respect around here, you know? And then kind of with those thoughts running through your mind, you finally fall asleep until your kid has to pee in the middle of the night and steps in your head on the way to the bathroom. And then you wake back up again. So I have something else besides sleeping on the floor that keeps me up at night. And it's this number. 70% of all young believers walk away from their faith within their first semester on a public campus. I find that number so arresting and so bothering, it turns my heart inside out. And that means, just to make it real, if you have 50 people in your youth group, 35 of them are walking away from their Lord within the first semester on a public campus. And it's not a problem with this generation. The reality is the world has changed since some of us were in high school and college. And our society is aligned against, against the lordship of Jesus in young people's lives in a way like it has never been before. And that resistance ramps up exponentially when they go off to college. And so we say to ourselves, well, send them to a Christian college then. That doesn't really solve the problem. Even when we include Christian colleges in the numbers, it's still 65% of young people are walking away from their faith when they go off to college. It's like, you, you ever put something precious, like a ring or something in your pocket, and you realize there was a hole in your pocket? That place that seemed like it was a safe place, you were putting it, and all of a sudden it's gone? It's like we're literally taking the future of the American church, and we're putting it in a bucket just to realize there's a hole in the bottom and it's spilling all over the floor. And that gets really personal when I step back and actually think about my own four kids. And I consider the reality where three of them might walk away from the Lord. I can't even engage with that idea. However, 
I don't believe it has to be that way. The Lord has privileged me with a unique viewpoint, and I've gotten to see a totally different path. Over these last 15 years, I've led a, a missions organization called Campus Target that sends young people into China for a year at a time on missions. And I've gotten to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people that not only are they falling away from the Lord, not only is their faith crashing when they step into those years of their life, but literally they are chasing after the Lord with a zeal and a passion and a love that calls me higher. A few years ago, I had the privilege out in Western New York to start a ministry training school called Ephesus. And as we did, and we saw these young people get raised up at that. I'm seeing these young people that are chasing after the Lord with their whole heart and pursuing a lifestyle of holiness and surrendering themselves to him with everything, even as they go through this 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, these years of their life. And they're actually heating up through those years. And now God's privilege be to come here to Radiant and help start Radiant School of Ministry and the incredible young people that are the future leaders of the body of Christ that I get to work with every single day and be with every single day it makes me realize there is hope on the horizon. And from this unique vantage point the Lord's given me, I believe that 70% number is not our destiny. In fact, I believe the Lord is raising up this generation right now and they are going to be leaders and influencers in a great awakening of what God is doing in this nation fresh again. I believe there's going to be a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit and they're going to be at the center of it. I believe the church's best days are ahead of it. But man, that 70% number, that keeps me up at night. If I stop and actually think about it, it makes me a little sick to my stomach. And if Jesus allows me to, I'm going to use my life to contend for that to change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And seeing you guys here fill this room, packed in here, amazing, during this conference right now, I'm just guessing that if you're at this meeting right now, there's something in your heart that is bothered by our present reality too. And there's something inside you that might also just want to lay your life down to see it changed. And so... Most of my ministry has been with young adults in like the 18 to 25 age range. And so I've gotten to see very close and personal over the years the results of what's poured into young people during their student years. But I'm also going to have Zach sharing with me today, who's a student pastor right on the front lines, right in the trenches of it right now too. And I wanted to hear both of those perspectives, basically, of those who are contending for it right now on either side of that demarcation line as we're contending to see this reality change. So today, instead of focusing on what's not working, we're actually going to focus on what is working. Looking at, through our personal experience, what research is telling us right now, what is working to actually help young people make that transition through to college and to stand strong and even grow hotter in their faith during that time period. And examining that from the different angles of what are the different things that has happened in their life that have come together to create the web that's caused them to have something to stick to. And so one resource that's been super helpful for us is this book, Faith for Exiles. Has anyone here read this yet? Okay, if you are in student ministry right now, this is an absolute must-read for what's happening in the church right now. It's by David Kinneman, who works with Barna, and basically so it's got the research and numbers behind understanding what's actually, and he takes the same view on it of what's actually working right now. If you are a student pastor right now, would you just lift your hand up? I want to give a couple of these away. If you're, if you're, we're going to do the youngest and the oldest in the room as student pastors right now. Okay, can we do that? Okay, if you're under 25, raise your hands. Under 23. 22? 21? 21? 20? You're looking at more conviction. Okay, if you are a student pastor and you're over 30, raise your hand. 35? 40? 45? 50? 46? 46? 47? 47? 47? You guys are amazing. (laughs) 
So that, that book has been super helpful for us as we've been engaging with that here. Um, we're going to be super practical as we talk about this today. This is not going to be all theory or anything like that. We're going to get down into what are we actually seeing work? What are the practices that are working? And we're going to draw out of our experience and the research that's happening right now, five practices that we see. Each of these is kind of like a line that works together to create a web, basically, that's helping young people stick through these transition years. And so uh, our first practice, we'll jump right in here, is this. Facilitate personal experiences with Jesus. Facilitate personal experiences with Jesus. I'll probably spend my longest talking on this topic today, and if I could emphasize any one thing that we talk about, I feel like this is an absolutely crucial strand, is that in how we do student ministry, we must facilitate personal experiences, personal encounters with Jesus. What, what, what do I mean by that? I mean those moments in the presence of God when, G, when a, per, a young person feels themselves connecting with Jesus in a personal way. I mean, those moments when they experience something supernatural, an unexplainable healing, a prophetic word that touches their heart, a word of knowledge that's totally unexplainable. I, I, I mean, th th those moments when they begin to experience something inside where they, they hear God's voice for themselves. And I've spent more than a decade in China doing ministry among young people there. And one of the things I've learned over their time in this secular, atheistic nation is that there is a chink in the armor of secularism and atheism that is wide open for the gospel to penetrate. And it is this, when they personally experience Jesus. Because if somebody has been told their whole life God is not real or they're starting to wrestle with that in their own heart, and then they experience the reality of God, the entire worldview collapses in a moment. During the first weeks I was in China, I, I, I'm, I'm, on the I'm coming to the country, I, I'm like 23 years old, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I just want, no, I want to tell people about Jesus. And so my buddy Matt, who went over with me, we meet this guy named Ren. He's a student on the college campus, and we, we, we're having lunch with him, and we begin to share with Ren just our testimony, and we begin to share the gospel with him. And as we're doing it, it was like you could see Jesus doing stuff in Ren. His eyes start like watering a little bit. And there's this feeling of like, this is the first person I'm going to get to lead to Christ in China. This is like amazing. It's happening right now. And in the middle of the conversation, all of a sudden, when that moment's happening, Ren just interrupts and he goes, well, by, the, by the way, I just want you to know I'm a member of the Communist Party. So, oh, Okay. Is that a threat? I'm not even sure what that was right there. I remember literally Matt, my buddy, I, I, I squeezed his leg under the table. Like, <laughs> are we in trouble? Are we going to jail? And so we kind of backpedal in the conversation a little bit and are just kind of freaked out. And so we talk afterwards and we pray and we say, we need to give Ren a few weeks to kind of understand what that meant and just happen and, and see what happens. So a few weeks later, it was actually the day after Christmas, we're on that college campus and there's this English corner gathering where students are practicing their English and we see Ren on the other side of this huge crowd at this event. And he sees us, hey, Toby, Matt, long time no see. Ren, how you doing? He said, guess what? I said, what? He said, I became a Christian. <laughs> you, you became a what? We didn't even tell you how to do that yet. He said, I became a Christian. What happened? So it's a serious story. He said, I was involved with a girl on campus and I found out some things. So I went into the health clinic on campus to have some tests done, and I came back HIV positive. Oh, this is serious. And he said, I felt like my life was over. HIV had a huge stigma in China at that time. He could have gotten kicked out of college even and stuff like that. And so he's just like, my life's over. And so he's just walking around the campus numb. And he tells me, he said, all of a sudden it just hit me. I just began to cry, Toby. And so I, I just ran up the, the stairs to my fourth floor dorm room, and I just went in, and I, I just I was laying by my bed, and I was crying and crying and crying. And he tells me, right here at this English corner, he says, I looked up through my tears, and on my roommate's bookshelf, I saw a Chinese Bible. His roommate wasn't a Christian. He was a religion major in school. He said, but I, I remembered what you told me about Jesus. So he said, I walked over, and I, I grabbed the Bible off the shelf, and I didn't know what to look at or anything, so I just flipped it open randomly, and I looked down, and the words hopping off the page to me were, I will heal you. He slams the Bible shut, you know? <laughs> He's been told there's no God his whole life. He's an atheist through and through. That doesn't make sense at all. He goes over to the Bible a second time, randomly opens it again. It says, you will be healed. A third time, he randomly opens the scriptures, and it's a verse about healing. So he said, I didn't know what to do, Toby. I just started making promises to God. He said, he said I told him, if you heal me, Jesus, I will follow you for my whole life. I'm going to tell my family and friends about you. He said, uh, I'm going to change my birthday to today. We didn't even talk to him about being born again. He got that all on his own. He said, I'm going to change my birthday to today. And he had a scholarship. He said, I'm going to give away my scholarship to someone who needs it more than me. 
So the peace of God just fills the room, and he falls asleep on his bed. The next morning, he goes back in to get the confirming test done on his HIV diagnosis, and it comes back totally clean. He's totally healed. And so now he's at this English corner. He says, Toby, I'm going to tell my family and friends I'm following Jesus for my whole life. I got a new birthday. I just have one question. Do I have to give my scholarship away? <laughs> I said, Ren, we will let you figure that out. Let me tell you something. Ren, who was following Jesus, never doubted God again. Okay? And when you personally experience the living God, it changes everything. It, it breaks down every stronghold or attack that can come against that belief that tries to push you away from your faith because you've actually experienced it. And as we work with our Radiant School of Ministry students here, and I get their stories as I've gotten to know them over the course of the year, almost every single one of them, there was some experience they had during their teen years where their faith became real for them. Maybe it was at a bold conference in Kansas City where they were there, and they experienced the power of God, and all of a sudden, that was the marking line of their life, and they changed and where they're going, and now they're chasing after Jesus with all their heart. Uh, I, 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 each of them has their own. Some of them circuit riders came to Western University, and, and, uh, and while they, Western Michigan, while they were there, uh, healing started happening. Three or four of them gave their lives to Jesus as college students, and now they're chasing after him with all their lives. And, and God does this where he gives us these experiences, but it's not just what brings people into the kingdom. The reality is these experiences serve as anchors that hold us in the kingdom. I, I'll just share very vulnerably from my own personal experience you know, we started this China ministry and it just blew up. God's favor was all over. We have 60 missionaries in China. We're 25 years old. We have no idea what we're doing at all. And in the midst of that, my best friend who went with me in the beginning and founded the whole thing began to have a crisis of faith. And he overnight basically quit. His faith was falling apart. He was wrestling with all kinds of personal stuff. He started blogging about it publicly so it impacted our whole group and everything like this. And in that time, I moved from being in China for a few years back to the States and for those of you that have worked with missionaries at all, that move back to the States is often very, very difficult and takes a lot of your resilience away. And so as I'm in this vulnerable place, I'm seeing my best friend walk through this crisis of faith, and all of a sudden, all this doubt starts to bubble up in my heart too. And I'm wrestling with it. And I'm probably a little burnt out, so I'm exhausted and just going through this really difficult season of wrestling and doubt. And the thing that brought me out of that was I was alone with the Lord, and I was wrestling with all that stuff, and I just came to the conclusion, I have seen and I have tasted too much. I just began to review the experiences of my life, the prophetic words that had been spoken over me, the miracles that I had seen, and it was just, I, I, I just said, I cannot deny this, no matter this cloud of whatever the enemy is doing over my mind right now, I have an anchor because I have tasted and I have seen. And when we can help facilitate those kind of experiences for our students, we actually are helping them put anchors into solid ground. You know, it, it, there can be a thing that says, oh, experiences, this is just summer camp stuff, you, you're high and then you're back in the valley and you lose the whole thing. And yes, there is other things that matter too, we'll talk about in a second. But you cannot ignore the holding power of having absolutely personally experienced Jesus. Zach, I just want to invite you up, bro. Anything you want to share from kind of your experience on the student side of stuff? Yeah, no, it's so good what uh, Pastor Toby is saying. And then just really practically, I want to hit on how this has impacted me and even in our youth ministry today. M me and Pastor Preston is over there. We get to lead it together. So we grew up together uh, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, New Life Church. Uh, David Perkins, who's here, he's going to be speaking. He was our youth pastor. So uh, it's fun now, 15 years later, getting to do ministry together and um, still being in touch with him. But uh, for both of us, me and Preston, we grew up, again, kind of height of mid 2000s youth ministry you know it's like fear factor nights and we're locking kids in a coffin and with crickets and eating like this crazy wild stuff and i mean in along with that like i mean massive conferences 10,000 students in a room our youth group was over a thousand kids a week for a time but um both of us will tell you this is it was not the thousand or 10,000 kids at a conference that got us. It wasn't the crazy hype nights that got us. It wasn't the pizza, the AirPods, whatever you're giving away that got us. But for, for me, even my story, what the reason why I'm here today is because I met Jesus in a little tiny prayer room that they had open 24 seven in the church. And it was called a, the red room. It was really creepy if you think about it. Like it was painted red and like there's like red lights and people are writing prayers on the wall. But I'm here today because in a dark moment of my life, I went to the red room 
but, uh, and, and I met Jesus. He walked in the room and he talked to me. And it's like, that's why I'm here today. And I think I would bet money that most of us youth pastors are doing what we're doing today because of a moment like that. So my question that I'm asking myself is why the heck do we spend so much time not making those moments? So just even my story, again, even in leading in student ministry, a few years back, I just had a moment where I started looking at my hours of my week, my budget, and even what I'm thinking about, and this my, my thoughts. And I'm like, I'm spending over half my time, my budget, and my thoughts towards these giant events. Trying to get new kids in the door and invite your friends and we're going to have pizza and here's some AirPods and it's going to be so, it's going to be the best night of your life. Like, you know, like we try to, we say all this crap to try to get kids to come. Um, and I'm like, why? Again, and you know, because you have those big nights and you know, you have two, 300 kids in a room, but it's like, do you know any of their names the next day? Did any of them come the next week? So for us, we've just been in a process of where are we putting our priorities and it has to be encountering the Lord. So a few things that looks like for us just really practically is we build our youth ministry around a prayer meeting. We have weekly expressions of ministry that take place. If that's Wednesday night, senior high, Sunday, Sunday morning, uh, junior high, we build our prayer um, or our youth ministry around a Monday night prayer meeting where we have 80 leaders in a room and we are encountering the presence of God every single week, praying for schools, encountering the presence of God. That's a big one. Other one is just trips, events, and, and, um, this, and not even like flashy trips. It's not like, hey, we're planning a big conference and we're gonna have a competition and a giant slime war or whatever, but it's like, we're gonna get, even two weeks ago, we're gonna get 40 kids in a house and we're gonna get an acoustic guitar in a cajon and we're gonna encounter the power of God doesn't have to be flashy. It's not complicated. When we were planning that event, you know how easy it was? It's, hey, we're renting a house and I get a worship leader. And we show up and the power of God falls and kids are still talking to us a couple weeks later about like how it changed their life. And I believe even seeds were sown in that moment. So just really practically, it's like, and it's not complicated, but it's what are we, and it's what Pastor Lee just talked about. Are we more concerned about building our ministry or building the kingdom. So that's all I got. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, th those two things he touched on, right? One, building into the weekly rhythm of what you're doing in your student ministries, moments of encounter. Where they use the prayer meeting here as kind of center for what they're doing. There's other ways to do that too. But you gotta have it in the regular rhythm of what's happening. But then two that he mentioned too, and I think this is so crucial, is to invest heavy in big events that will help promote those encounters. I'm not talking about the, the fear factor thing. I'm talking about going to bold conference, taking your students on a mission trip. Those things that basically are super time intensive and super hard work and they're very easy to talk yourself out, to, out of because of that, those things actually make a difference. I can think of missions trips I went on as a teenager that led to me being a missionary for 15 years. I can think of encounters sitting in the back row of a conference that literally changed the trajectory of my life. And, and don't don't ignore those things just because uh, they're not the complete package. Yeah, that's good. And then the third thing I would say, though, in this area, and this is something I'm very passionate about, is to train your young people to spend regular, unhurried time with Jesus. Yeah. One, one of the interesting numbers, actually, in that book and the study is that 90% of those who make it, kind of who are in that good group, not the 70%, they say, when I read the Bible, I know how to encounter Jesus. Yeah. That was a statement they agreed with. And then the number is like 30% for all the others that fall away. And, and, and so they basically learned at some point along the way how to actually meet Jesus in their quiet time. And even though we could all in this room right now would acknowledge that spending time with Jesus is an incredibly important part of following him, an incredibly important part of growing with him, I can count on one hand the number of churches and families I've met in my entire life that actually trained their kids to do it. I didn't say teach, I said train. And so I don't mean standing up in front of them and saying, here's four things you can do in your quiet time, which that is also valuable, but I mean actually do it together. Let them watch you do it. Tell them what to do and then have them do it in front of you and then talk about it afterwards and actually train them of those things that we're saying are the most important things. And how do you do that? You, you can take a part of your student's time every single week for 15 minutes. You just have them, every, each kid do that. Or you do a special thing once every three months where you do that and you train people. You have a special, there's tons of ways to do it, but actually train them to do that because if they learn how to do that, they will become a vehicle of themselves can having 
continual encounters with the Lord that put those anchors in their life. Okay, number two, second, second practice here. I think, you know, we, we all know instinctively that those experiences are not enough on their own, right? We need to help our students be grounded in the unchanging reality of God's word. And the specific practice, though, I want to talk about today is this, to contrast the Bible with culture. To contrast the Bible with culture. For many years, what I did as I would teach is I would just stand up and I would just teach my students the Bible. And I, you know, I, I found, though, that as the world has changed, my methods needed to change. And that what they are getting from other sources is now pushing hard enough against what the Bible is saying in their life that I need to highlight for them the contrast between the two things so they can see that it's different and those things are not having the ability to sneak into their mindsets. Okay, and so Jesus, we see actually do this in the Sermon on the Mount, right? What does he say? You have heard it said, but I say unto you. You have heard it said, right? Uh, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say unto you that anyone who is angry with his brother will face judgment. You've heard it said, you, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And he's looking at the culture of the people he's speaking to in Israel. And he's taking quotes from the Old Testament law even. And he's showing the incompleteness of that perspective as he contrasts it with what he's bringing to teach to them. And what I found is that I need to actually make that clear contrast as I'm teaching students. And this was a shift that has to happen in your teaching, that you actually declare what culture is saying and then show the contrast. And so just, you know, in, in, in real short here, right? You've heard it said that you discover the truth about yourself by looking inside yourself. But I say to you, you discover the truth in the person of Jesus Christ and in his word. You've heard it said that you should pursue the things you desire the most. It's about you. You do you. But I say to you, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You've heard it said that love is love. But I say to you, God is love, and he determines what it looks like. You've heard it said that gender is a matter of personal choice. But I say unto you, gender was established by God in the beginning as a part of his plan for all creation. Okay, and so I'm taking things that they're hearing every day through every TV show they watch, every video game they play, every song they listen to is programming them with a certain perspective. I'm saying, you're hearing this, and I'm telling you something different here right now. And being able to contrast like that. I had a cool experience with my kids just recently with this. Our, our kids, they love the Lord, but it was like when we were in church and worshiping, they just like were not really worshiping. They were just kind of like hands in the pockets. And I'm like, this is not who I'm raising my kids to be. And so I was just wrestling with this a little bit. And so my wife was sick one day, so we were home from church. And I just said, we're not going to watch Radio Online. I'm, Daddy's going to teach today. And so we did, we did some worship, and then I stood up, and I just began to teach them from the Bible, uh, from Psalms, basically the seven different Hebrew words for praise. If you've never seen this before, it's amazing. The different words you see praise in the book of Psalms, there's actually seven different words, and they mean things like bowing down, lifting your hands, dancing around clamorously, different things like that. And I just began to say, in the Bible, this is how God tells us he wants to be worshipped. I talked about kneeling, I talked about lifting the hands, I talked about you know, just uproariously celebrating and these different words that are in the Bible. Shouting is another one of them. And I said, what you will hear around you is people say, you worship the God the way you want to worship him, the way it feels good to you. But what I say to you is that in our family, we worship God the way he wants to be worshiped. Right? And I drew that contrast for them. And so we kind of had our moment, and we were shouting in the living room, and we were dancing around uproariously, and it was the kind of thing. But I'm like, is that even going to impact their life? The next week, Pastor Preston sends me a picture of my oldest daughter, Maya, in junior high church. And it's a picture of her just kneeling on the ground with her hands like this, worshiping God. It's one of my most precious possessions now that he sent to me. It was just this precious, precious thing. And I realized, you know, I planted a seed that helped her engage with that. Okay, and it's those kind of messages that help our students. Uh, Zach, anything you want to share practically on this one? Yeah, um, I think really practically, um, language that I've used as I've uh, been talking to my kids about this is 1 Corinthians 2, wisdom of God versus wisdom of the world. We have to recognize that there is a wisdom of the world, and but challenging them to, again, use cultural discernment 
from the word of God to engage those things. So I think one thing practically that we need to do is we cannot shy away from hard topics. We have to talk about the difficult things. And I know sometimes like as a youth pastor, you're coming in, you're like, I'm 22, 23, like, am I qualified to talk about this? Like, I just think, and again, we don't have to be experts, but we have to join the conversation on these things. So even the other week, I, um, I talk, preached on racism to my students. I'm like, we need to understand what the word of God says about racism. Let's have a theology for the, the one people of God. Let's have a theology for celebrating diversity in the people of God. Let's read the Bible and realize, I read Revelation 4, 5, and 6, and we see every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping Jesus in their own language. Like, we have to get that. And, and, but even more, even though I think it's so significant to have a theology um, that addresses things like racism, I think the more important message that I didn't even talk about that night was the Bible is relevant to the world we live in, right? Like, don't go get discipled on TikTok or Instagram. The word of God has a worldview for these things. And I think so often youth pastors, you know, we're like just talking, Jesus loves you. And like, how can you have good friends? And those are good things. But I think it gets the therapeutic theology. We have this idea that God just exists to make me feel good. But then for real, real problems in the world, okay, I gotta, I'm going to go to TikTok. I'm going to go to now this. I'm going to go to PragerU as opposed to the word of God. So we can't, again, our kids are being discipled with the wisdom of the world. We have to give them language to know that. But then, um, and again, some other ways we're doing this. We do Red Hots. Pastor Lee does them where it's just a live Q&A. We do not do live Q&A with students. <laughs> Gosh. We do not do live Q&A with students. Even our Texans are pretty... Uh, Pretty crazy, but, um, but we say, hey, do Q&A series. We're doing a series called Raw this next month. We're just talking about raw conversations about sex, raw conversations about um, gender, raw conversations about whatever they want to talk about. Like we're digging into these hard topics. And I think as youth ministries, again, we've got to teach cultural discernment in the world of, word of God. We have to teach God's version of wisdom um, and recognize that there's a worldly wisdom. That seems wise. That's the last thing I'll say about that. Like it's, wor the world's wisdom seems wise to the world. It seems wise to our kids. And if we don't give them a biblical reason, if we just say, hey, that's wrong, we don't give them the actual reasons, if we don't engage it theologically, um, our kids are going to get torn apart in college. That's good, Zach. So, go ahead. I just had a question for oh, Zach. Do you have a way to connect then the, the parents with the kids so that when they get home, they can extend that conversation at home and equip parents to be able to have that conversation with their kids? It's a really good idea. Um, <laughs> we're working on it. We'll, we'll, we're going to hit on even parent involvement. That's kind of our next point. You're, you're, you know where we're going. <laughs> As someone who over this last year came into the Radiant Movement from the outside, one of the things that is so precious about this movement, and it flows from Pastor Lee, is he loves the Bible. Like, he just loves the Bible. Like when I first came here, like Pastor Lee has like his real nice expensive Bible and that's like the gifts he gives like these really expensive Bibles. And like me, I'm coming from New York. I'm like, this must be like a Midwest thing. Like this, like, like, like at first I was like, I don't get really what the deal is here. Like the Midwest thing, your expensive Bibles, I always spent 20 bucks on mine. I'm not really sure what the deal is here. But as I've been here, I've realized it's just a manifestation that he loves the Bible. And it bleeds through this church and it bleeds through this movement. And for those of you that are part of this radiant movement, lean into that because you actually just loving the Bible will ooze out and multiply in your students a love for a Bible. Because here's the deal, you, you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. Okay, and who you are, if you love the Bible and you have this inside your heart, that is actually going to get caught by your students and that will give them one of these strings in the web that holds them close to Christ through the most difficult times. Okay, number three, and our question did go this way. Practice basically helping our students not be in the 70%. Involve parents and mentors in their discipleship. Involve parents and mentors in their discipleship. One of the markers, as you look at the studies of those whose faith is making it through the transition to adulthood, is that they have multi-generational relationships in the church. Uh, they're being poured into and loved by those who are older than themselves. They're, tw they're twice as likely, those who, those who stay are twice as likely as those who fall away to feel valued by and get input from believers who are older than them. 
they're much more likely to have positive emotional experiences with people at church. I, I, I saw a tweet that said it this way. The teenager who looks over the congregation and thinks, these are my people, I belong here, looks up at heaven and says, this is my God, I belong in his presence. And basically, as that, these relationships happen like this, we as student pastors and leaders can help facilitate that. And actually, I feel like these guys are doing an amazing job here at the church with that. So I just want to let Zach share about this a little bit more. Um, yeah, so... With, with family, and I think it's kind of the two-part, again, multi-generational discipleship, bringing in older people, but also the family element. And specifically, the family element has just been something the Lord's really burdened me uh, for specifically in, in this kind of post-COVID world. Um, there was an interview with, uh, again, David Kinnaman um, talking about, again, current statistics and... Basically, what he said is, like, we're at a point of no return for our culture. When we look at biblical worldview, church attendance, whatever, like, we're, we're at a point of no return for our culture. He's like, unless two things happen. He's like, the first is we need a uh, awakening revival move of God. And he, he, I mean, he was encouraging. He's like, hey, there's been points in U.S. history, not just world history, U.S. history, where church attendance uh, worldview has been worse than it is today. But each time God sovereignly moves, there's an awakening. There's a revival of uh, love for God, love for the word of God. Um, so he's like, we, we need to pray for revival. And I think most of us in this room would be behind that, is we need to see revival. The, the second piece is really what hit me hard. But uh, he said, with that, we need a radical reemphasis of family discipleship. In the past 50 years, we've seen the nuclear family be deconstructed in our country. And in, in a lot of ways, but parents no longer, in our churches, parents no longer see the see hold the responsibility of discipling their kids. And I'm sure even in this room, how many times does a parent say, hey, will you come mentor my kid? He's really struggling. And I'm like, I can't, I can say this because it's a room of youth pastors, but I'm like, I can't fix in an hour and a half what you broke in 15 years. (laughs) Just being real. I can't fix, like, I can't fix your kid. Like, and and obviously, like, again, I'm going to meet with that kid. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to give him wisdom steps to, like, get help, but I can't fix that. I think, again, here's, here's my thing. I think we have viewed youth ministry as a department in the church. We need to see next gen ministry as a mission of the church in the church congregation, in student ministries, and in families. I think church congregations need to change their thinking. Um, student ministry is not a church amenity to get families to come and tithe. We don't exist to like make parents comfortable in, on Sunday mornings so that they can show up and tithe. That's just not it. We can't do that anymore. We have to see it as, again, the mission to make disciples is the next generation. Uh, 2016, 66% of Christians accept uh, the Lord before they're 18. This is the biggest mission field of the church, young people. Second, student ministries. We need to become a discipleship machine, not an attractional event. We're not here to just get butts in seats. We need to make disciples. But then the third part is families. I think we need, as student ministries, we have a responsibility to equip parents. We need to train parents. And again, we're wrestling with this. This is a conversation we're having as a church currently. But like, how are we equipping parents to disciple their kids? And not just saying like, hey, here's a book or like pray for them. Like, how can we really have a training process for parents to make disciples? I think that needs to be holistic. I think, again, that can look like a lot of things. If that's older people on your volunteer team, uh, we bring in uh, church elders to like pray for our kids, for our seniors when they graduate. That's a really cool moment. Like even creating relationships um, intergenerationally in the church. Th- there's, a, I think, a lot of practicals that we're still working out. I'm sure some of you guys would have great ideas with that. But, but the biggest thing that we're feeling is like we need to reemphasize the family's role to make disciples. If people in your church think it's your job to disciple their kid, you've already lost. Like parents have to get that it's their responsibility to disciple their kid. Um, and even we, we talked on this, me and Pastor Preston, a few weeks ago, and just, just even challenging parents. It's like, parents, again, there's a lot of parents that are more concerned about their kid's baseball scholarship than their eternal salvation. And instead of us just complaining about that with our kids, we need to disciple the parents so that they can disciple their kids. So just some thoughts. I don't, yeah, we're working it out. It's good. Number four here. Create a missional environment. Create a missional environment. One of the most powerful things you can do to help your students be in the world but not of it is to help them see their place while they're in the world, that they are here as ambassadors of Christ. 
And that when a student begins to embrace mission, it literally flips a switch and changes the way they view everything. I've gotten to experience this so powerfully over the years because of the work I've done in China, where I take young people, 18, 19 years old, over to China for a year with me, and they step into actually being a missionary in China, reaching other college students there with the gospel. And I've just seen time and time again that when the student takes that step to change their mindset, to think of themselves as a missionary, something switches inside their mind and heart. All of a sudden, a new energy and urgency for their own pursuit of God comes in because they actually need him for what they have to do that day. Uh, They begin to walk into each day not being influenced by their environment, but with, with an intention to be an influencer in their environment. Think about it for a second. When I think of myself as a missionary... I think of myself as someone who is outside of, but influencing. And when a student, a young person, and they don't even have to be going overseas, but when they begin to get that mindset about their life here in the States, a switch flips inside, and they shift from being basically influenceable and passively receiving messages all the time to now being basically an active part of that process. And then if you can help your students flip that switch, it changes everything in this issue that we're talking about. Um... There's an aspect of a young person's heart that only comes alive when they're living for something bigger than themselves. And God himself put that in the heart of every young person. And the world is happy to grab that place if you're not going to give them a mission. And so they will find their bigger than themselves thing out in the world somewhere if we don't actually share the mission of the church with them. You know, building a missional environment means that in our student ministries, everything we're doing is imbued with this idea of we are trying to reach others for Christ, that great commission mindset. It's a challenge to invite friends to come to events. It's a training on how to share the gospel with their friends. It's preaching on the great commission and evangelism. Catch this statistic. Only 10% of millennial churchgoers know what the Great Commission is. The parting words of Jesus before he left this earth, one of the things that is like the crowning scripture verses in the Bible, only 10% of millennial Christians know what it is. 50% say they've never even heard the phrase. Another 40% they've heard it, but they don't know what it means. We have not shared with these younger generations who have this hole in their heart looking for something bigger than themselves, the gift that Jesus gave them, if they have a purpose and something worth living for. And so it's very, very important. And so the evidence is very clear across statistics that those whose faith makes it through that college transition have some kind of missional DNA in them. Here's some statistics of what they say. 75% strongly believe I have a responsibility to tell others about my beliefs. It's less than half of that for every other kind of churchgoer. 66% are excited about the church's mission in the world. It's less than half of that for every kind of churchgoer. There's something in this group that makes it that says, I have embraced the mission of God for my life. And it's really cool seeing how in the regular things we can do in our student ministries, they'll actually catch it. So my oldest daughter, Maya, is 10, and she's in the junior high ministry at Portage, where Pastor Preston is the student ministries pastor. And I don't even know what all he does with her. But the other night, I'm putting Maya to bed, and I'm laying next to her in her bed, and we're talking as I get ready to say goodnight to her. And she goes, oh, just a second. She gets up, climbs out of her bed. I'm just sitting there by myself in the bed now. What's going on? She walks over into her closet. She gets on her knees in her closet. And I didn't know it, but there's this little calendar in there that's like unreached people groups of the world. My little 10-year-old Maya just starts praying out loud for the Uzbekistan and that God would bring the gospel there and they would come to know him. What's happening? Something has been planted inside her heart through what she's experienced. I didn't buy that calendar for her. I don't even know where she got it from. I didn't tell her, you should have a daily habit of praying for unreached people groups of the world, even though that is something important to me. She caught that from others that were influencing her. And if we can create an environment, not just foreign missions, but where people begin to think of their life as having a mission, it changes everything. One of the ways that both Repressed and Zach and myself when we talk about this is we talk to our students about viewing themselves as missionaries to their school. Okay, that is a phrase we use all the time. We talk about it all the time and it turns upside down their mindset for their life. It takes the Great Commission away from being some kind of future radical reality for some people to something that is real for me today. And it takes the concept of a missionary, one who's giving their life for a mission and calls them to step up to the plate now. 
And so when I preach to young adults all around the country, I use that language and concept, and I'm seeing young people step up into that, give their lives for that. So many times I speak at conferences, hundreds and hundreds of young people are offering themselves up for that mission. Why? Because there's something in their heart that Jesus created to long to be a part of something like that. And when I put the challenge out there, there's an echo in their soul, and they're stepping into that. And if you would challenge your young people to be missionaries to their high school, something gets activated them beyond what is happening otherwise. Zach, I know you guys are doing this real. Tell us what it's about. Yeah, just a quick testimony with that. I want to share Preston's testimony. Um, I won't share mine, I'll share his. But, um, but again, this language, be a campus missionary, was drilled into us as young people. It was, hey, like, go start a prayer meeting on your school, evangelize, pray for people on your school campus. It, we talked about it every week. Um, part of Preston's testimony, again, in that language, even being a campus missionary, like, it was always like, hey, praying, God, what do you have for me at my school? What are you leading me to do at my school? And um, what's so cool, again, about Preston's story is as he was praying, he felt the Lord uh, tell him to change the school that he'd been going to for 10 years, 13 years, and go be a missionary to a public school in our city. He had been, again, he'd grown up, again, it was a charter school, really great school, top-ranked test scores, whatever, but the Lord said, go change schools and be a missionary to another school. I think that is such a powerful testimony of the fruit of, again, campus missionary culture. Do your kids see themselves as missionaries to their schools? Um, even my story, again, my, my senior year, I ended up rallying my campus run a prayer meeting where we would pray three times a week. We would go on uh, parent-teacher work days or whatever, or like the conference days, and we would pray from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. On, on our school campus. Like we'd have shifts, and it culminated with uh, calling my campus to pray and fast for a move of God at the end of our school year. Again, and, and that DNA that's in us, it wasn't there an accident. It didn't just happen, but it was uh, leaders like David Perkins, uh, Stephen Davis saying, you are a missionary to your school today. Your Christian faith doesn't begin when you turn 18. Like you are the church today. So those are just some testimonies. Again, I think getting your kids to start a prayer meeting on, on school campus. It's, it's got to be, it's a metric of engagement, even what Pastor Lee was talking about. How are your students engaging? Are they praying on their school campus? So good. Preston, you're cooler every time I hear a story about you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, last one here, then we'll do a little Q&A. Number five, make the investment to lay their foundation deep. Make the investment to lay their foundation deep. I believe that their environment and the world has changed over these last couple decades, but that our advice and as parents and pastors for what to do when they graduate high school has just stayed the same. Yep. And for many of our churches and families, their plans for our young people are something like this. Uh, go to college, get a bachelor's degree, get a job, get married. And in my opinion, the advice we're giving our young people is too small for the hour in which they live. Yeah. It's like in, in sports, you know, in, in sports, the clock determines the play, right? Like if you think of a, a football game or something like that, in and, and the first quarter of a football game, like you're doing certain kinds of plays. You do a little three-yard run up the middle to establish the run, and you're thinking through things like that. But in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter, you don't do that same play. The clock determines the play. The hour of the game, it's not appropriate to do the run in that kind of moment. It's not the right play in that situation. And for many of us in the church, we are still calling the same plays as we have for the last 40 years when the world has changed underneath of us. And we have to think differently about about the plays. We are in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter right now. The play calling has to change. And so for, for in my mind, we must encourage our students to sacrificially invest in their faith and that strategic moment of leaving home after high school. For those of you who've walked through students with this, or you've done any kind of campus ministry at college at all, that moment when a student leaves home for the first time, their heart and their life become wet cement for a season. And over that next season, it is going to be molded, the, the habits they have for their life, the values and way they think about things and the trajectory of where they're going is going to be molded during that unique wet cement season. Yeah. So why during that wet cement season are we sending them into universities where every part of the situation is built to draw them away from Christ? Right. We're calling a play from 40 years ago that is no longer appropriate today. This is the advice and challenge I give for every young person today, for every Christian parent, for every student pastor that wants to set the precious person they've invested so much in on, on a path that is going to actually lead them where they want them to go. Take a gap year 
and invest it into some kind of discipleship environment. Get them into that wet cement season of leaving the house for the first time and let it be in a discipleship environment that molds that wet cement for where they want to go for the rest of their life. Okay, and so have them go to discipleship school or school ministry for a year. Have them go with YWAM. Have them be an intern in your church. I'll bring them with my team to China if you don't know what to do with them, okay? We'll get them over there. We'll do crazy stuff. But do something that sets them up in a discipleship environment. I, I don't mean a Christian college. That's not the same thing. That's the play from 40 years ago, okay? No longer sufficient today. They put them in a discipleship environment that is forming them and shaping them for what God's called them to do. Over this last year, I moved my family across the country here to start Radiant School of Ministry because I believe we need stuff like that here. And so we have shaped every part of this thing to try to help develop resilient disciples of Jesus Christ. And so whether it's the week-to-week stuff or the big events we do, we're helping to facilitate encounters with Jesus where they meet him in ways that become anchors for their whole life. As the director of the school, one of the main things I do is I'm with them at 8 in the morning and we open the Bible together and we talk about how do you read the Bible? How do you pray? Let's practice it together. Let's talk about it afterwards and training them how to spend regular unhurried time with Jesus. We're contrasting the Bible and culture and talking about that stuff together. We're putting trustworthy mentors in their lives that are having regular one-on-ones with help making it real. And we do regular out- I haven't. I had to fight for this when we designed the thing. I get them out for six weeks into the mission field as a part of the program because I think it's so important that they get that missions thing activated in their life. We are building a booster shot to come into the discipleship that's already happened in the family and the local church to set them up for the hour in which they live. Okay, and so that is my challenge to you as student pastors. You cannot use the plays from 40 years ago. Come to youth group, go to college, everything's going to work out fine. It is not appropriate for the fourth quarter, and that's where we are right now. You have to call the play that works now. And so make the investment in their faith. And it's, to me, it starts even with this group right here that are working with young people. Because you're not only having to disciple the young people in this idea, you have to disciple parents too. Okay? Some parents, in some ways, are going to be the biggest challenge in changing this new way of thinking. They want their kids to succeed. They want their kids to not fall behind or anything like that. And so there's, they're on that 40 years ago play that seems like it worked in the past. It is not working today. 70% of our kids are walking away from their faith, things must change. And we have to embrace that reality. Disciple the kids and prepare the parents for it too. Don't keep calling first quarter plays in the fourth quarter. So those four, five practices, facilitate personal experiences with Jesus, contrast the Bible with culture, involve parents and mentors in discipleship, create a missional environment, and make the investment to lay the foundation deep, the gap year. Those are the five things that we're serving, what we're seeing right now as we're looking at research research that are so important for changing our present reality and seeing the church step into its finest hour. Okay, I want to open it up as we finish up here. Just any questions on this idea, any of these ideas, and we'll go right there. If you want to share on that? I mean, they're leading their, you know, their kind of. kids are becoming Christians and the parents are like, whoa, 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 what's going on over there? First, it's amazing that's an experience you're having right now that you're actually reaching lost students. Yeah. So, Missional environment, awesome. Yeah, I think you got to disciple the parents that you have. You know, if you're not discipling the parents you don't have, or you won't, if you're not discipling the parents you have, you'll never disciple the parents you don't have. Really? So it's like, if it's not even a value in the families that go to your church, like, it, it has to start there. And I think after that, it can be something you bring to other parents. But um, again, and I think practically kind of what we've seen is how you interact with parents changes over the years. Again, as like when you're working with kids ministry, it's all parents. Junior high kind of starts turning to a hybrid. Senior high is parents give them the credit card to sign up for a treat kind of thing. And you know, and there's some senior high parents that are more involved and that's awesome. And I think we got to lean into those relationships. Like whenever a parent's like, hey, I want to get lunch with you, it's like clear your calendar and make it happen. Um, but uh, I think you got to disciple the parents you do have. Just some ideas that we've been throwing around. It's like, what would it look like to have a parenting conference? Yeah. Uh, a church that's doing this really well is um, John Tyson in a Church of the City in New York. He has like a, a parenting uh, step webinar thing every month where he talks about spirit-led parenting. Like, what are we doing in our churches to empower parents? That's good. And just to speak hope into this, 
Many times, once a student gives their lives to Christ, their family is just a domino to follow yeah. later. Yeah. And especially if you're creating that missional environment, I, I think of just our students here at RSM this year. We have multiple students that have led family members to Christ. One girl led both of her siblings to Christ. Another girl uh, works at a, 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 like a, a home for older people. She's led 10 people to Christ at that home over the course of this year. It, it, once they begin to catch this stuff, it will spread to their families. That, that, it's, it's unavoidable. Good. Other questions? Talk, talk for a sec about what you guys do to kind of get that campus missionary thinking and actually happen, happen become real. Yeah. Um, you got to talk about it a lot. I think that's this language, like from, you got to preach on it, you got to talk about it. But for moments, again, I think that moments in the presence of God encourage mission to people. Again, it starts in prayer, it starts in encounter, and then it goes out. So again, I think, uh, again, investing into those encounter moments. Uh, one thing that we do for our seniors specifically, again, even hitting on that mission, we're planning it right now, but we do a prophetic presbyter presbytery for our seniors each year. So more than it's like saying, hey, we're going to like throw a party and like here's a Bible. Like we have a prophetic presbytery. We reach out to pastors, elders in the church, and we give them each graduating senior and they pray for a month. And then we have a big banquet and they prophesy over our seniors and they're prophesying purpose, calling, whatever. Again, it, it is powerful. Like it's such a, it's a marking moment. And what's so cool too is then that encourages discipleship. We have seniors that got prophesied over by elders in our church and they've been mentoring them for the past three, four years. So it's like stuff like that. So again, encouraging, having prophetic culture, using it in your language. Language. Um, in Faith for Exiles, they talk about uh, creating a culture for vocational uh, calling. So understanding like following Jesus for some people looks like ministry, but for a lot, it looks like ministry, not in the church, right? Like having that language, like maybe you're called, you, you have a gifting for engineering. Hey, go be a disciple maker in the engineering field. One of the things I believe really strongly and that is, is a little less in favor today maybe than it was in the past is having moments of response to a challenge in the presence of God. Yeah. You know, what we consider like altar moments maybe. Um, because that acts, you know, we, they live in a culture that every message is that you should be driven by your emotions. And when I bring them to a place of making a decision, I'm teaching them to be a will-driven person, not an emotions-driven person. And, and so when I create those moments of I'm responding to something right now, Lord, there, a call's been out to offer yourself up as missionaries to your high school. I've now come to the front. I'm on my knees saying, Lord, you can use me however you want to use me. I'm, I'm, I'm yours. Basically, those moments as they experience the spirit in that is going to have, because their will's involved too, is going to have directional impact on their life. Yeah. It's good. So um, just mainly looking for advice. I'm like from right up in Bay City and uh, we're starting a youth group. Um, I'm right now a ministry intern, headed to be a student pastor there. Um, but any advice on creating a culture, I've prayed for the volunteers. We have a team set up. We just started, we just met last month for our first night. It's awesome. And uh, any advice basically to create a culture of training which is on me, let's just be honest, because it starts with leadership. Um, how can, what can I do to best train the students to have just a thirst for God and like just to be able to go out into the mission field, into the world, and just spread like wildfire? These two guys have done an incredible job in that one. One sec, can't see that. Um, get your leaders in your home. Encounter God with your leaders. Yeah. You know, don't like, you're not there to show your leaders how to encounter God, but like encounter God with your leaders, have worship nights in your house. Honestly, like starting off um, is such a cool opportunity because you don't have to rebuild anything. So even one thing, um, even Pastor Preston, um, getting two years now he's been here, but um, we, we were kind of in a season of kind of a reset two years ago and he came in and really led so strong. Just again, Simon, Simon Sinek, start with a why, which our mission statement is we exist to make resilient disciples. And we say it again and again and again. Like we're preaching on, I don't even know, friendship. And we're like throwing that in there. Like it's like every single time we talk, every time we meet with our team, we're hitting that why. We exist to make resilient disciples. And even like Pastor Toby, as we were prepping for this, he, he asked me, he's like, do you, what, what's your program for discipleship? And it kind of, it honestly kind of confused me for a second. I was like, it's like, we don't really have a program. It's just what we do. It's who we are. It's culture. You know, in having a culture that knows your values and knows who you are, more than do you have a discipleship program, do you have a discipleship culture? Yeah, and culture is caught by being close to you. That's good. 
You guys have been amazing for those uh, joining us online. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, for those of you guys that are here, come on up. I see a couple hands still in the back. Come up. We're happy to chat and answer questions. And then for those of you that have young people that you feel like something like that next kind of a step is important over this next season, talk to us about Radiant School Ministry, anything we can do to serve you guys, and have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you.